it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Lionel Chetwin. Lionel's a uh, screenwriter. He came to Hollywood uh, via London and Montreal. Yes. Uh, I've made two of those stops. Can't quite take it to the third level the way Lionel did. Uh, Lionel... Uh, well, the third depth. <laughs> the th yeah, the third circle of hell. Uh, Lionel, uh, actually a great, poss possibly the best movie about uh, an aspect of Montreal that's ever been made uh, with uh, my late colleague Mordecai Richler. Right, yeah. uh, Lionel wrote The Apprenticeship of Dirty Kravitz with uh, Richard uh, Dreyfus. Yeah, uh, yeah, and... Yeah. Uh, I know you identify as a Hollywood conservative, and Richard certainly doesn't. Uh, but he's actually one of the uh, the few big-time uh, Hollywood actors who actually said anything nice about my my book America Alone and recommended that people everybody should read it. So he he's he's kind of uh, he's kind of uh, he's adrift. Yeah, Richard is adrift. He, there are many that mm. have started to drift. We classify them as twelve uh, uh, nine eleven. Mm. People who kind of woke up on 9-11 and realized that it was quite a hostile world. And then there were some 9-12ers. And the 9-12ers are those who uh, got through 9-11 but became horrified on 9-12 at how their liberal colleagues were reacting. Right. Couldn't quite become, couldn't quite make, make it over to our side and are adrift somewhere in limbo. And Richard's one of these. He's, he's a great believer in the Constitution. He's wanted for years to... Uh, to Kathleen Cornell's book, uh, uh, A Miracle in Philadelphia. Uh, he's tried to set up things in public schools about teaching the Constitution, none of which, of course, gets him any, any credit from his liberal, his liberal cohort. Yeah. Um, yeah, so he would, of course he'd like you. I mean, he, he's, uh, <laughs> um, he, he realizes we've had this conversation. I mean, we both come, we both come from that group. Uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish community of the United States is blessed. No one... No group in the history of mankind has ever been, had such bounty heaped upon their shoulders. Uh, and that has to make you stop and think, what kind of a, what kind of a society is this that allowed that to happen? Yeah, you're, it, you're, you're not, though, a... Uh, and I, under, I understand where Richard uh, Dreyfus is coming from, because he's, he's not an unintelligent man. He no. reads widely. He understands that in the 21st century, something is afoot. And those blessings that you talk about, uh, there's nothing that says uh, they're eternal. Well, no. Most good times <laughs> in human history have just been a moment, and yes. that's it. Um, uh, but you, you're not a 9-11 conservative. No, no. I, I, I go back to Reagan. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in, in, um, in, where I grew up in Montreal, there was one party, and it was the left. Right. Now there are variations of the left from liberals to communists. Right, right. A guy called Frank Hanley, who was an Irish war healer. Right. Um, uh, but there was no, no, no one would be a Tory. I mean, nothing. No, no. That was an insult. No, um, there, there's usually, in most yeah. places, there's a nominal Conservative Party, but there's nothing even Not with that lived. name in, in the province yeah. of Quebec. Not where I lived. That was uh, a... Uh, we, we all lived in the continuum of ghettos in Montreal right. in those days. It was a huge city, fourth yeah. largest in the continent, but I lived within a particular community, the Jewish community, and that was within a smaller group thereof, and then there was the Westbound Jews, and there were the the Scottish barons. It was, right. it was just a continuum of, of, of little ghettos. Oh. Um, it really took me a while to understand that I was completely out of step with that. It first came, my first inkling came at a Pete Seeger concert organized by the uh, Junior Castor, the Junior Beaver League, oh. which was the Young Communist League in Canada. Oh. And I went and um, I had great aspiration. I mean, I, I was pretty much a failure at all things, but I believed I had a destiny for whatever reason. And, uh, and Pete Seeger stood on that stage with all the other speakers and talked about how I was a victim and how I was downtrodden. And I was so depressed by the end of it, you know. I was just <laughs> such a loser. Why? And I was with this friend of mine, this guy, a guy by the name of Tom Goodenough, who right. later was in the service with him, a wonderful man. And he said, do you believe all that? And I said, well, I, I you know, please tell me I shouldn't. And he, uh, said, uh. he said, you know, you believe that stuff? You're going to be downtrodden forever. Right. He said, they'll own you. You want them to own you? I said, no, I don't want them to own me. So, well, then open your eyes. And, th and that was the beginning of, of my journey, really. And so, it ended when I met Reagan. That, right. uh, I had a chance to meet him, and I realized what, you know. Uh, so it took a long time. I mean, it, when you, you know. when you eventually got to Hollywood in, in, in the 70s, yeah. there were kind of, um, you know, two sides in the town back then, because you, obviously Reagan uh, had uh, become a Republican, yeah. but he had Republican 
uh, supporters like uh, Frank Sinatra and whatever. That you, you got the feeling there were two, there were still uh, two... There were many more than yeah. there are today, yeah. but it's healthier today in, in this sense. It was generational. Hmm. If you came across Jerry Weintraub, it was the older people, sure, they were conservative. And they loved Ronnie, and they'd known Ronnie. Right. I've always believed, in fact, that one of the reasons Reagan was a great president was because of his years in Hollywood. In Hollywood, he met everybody. He met blacks and Jews and Chinese. Right. He, lived, he lived in a very you know, diverse world. Yeah. Diverse in the good sense of that word, yeah. w which may no longer exist the way right. it's used today. Right. Um, and, and so the older generation, in my generation, it was just unheard of. It was, yeah. you just didn't, uh, the word libertarian had yet to have white currency. I didn't think it was invented really until the 80s. Yeah. Um, and so it was, it was at that time very lonely in, in the 1980s. Um, and th the other thing was there was no sense that the country was drifting. Uh, Carter had frightened people, but that was seen as just some strange thing that had happened. And yeah. I think in the back of their minds for all of their professed uh, love of all human humanity, He's a southerner, you know, that's the way he talks, you know, there's, uh. there's this great contempt for the, for the South. See, that's also generation. You go back and look at the old movies of the 40s and the right. 60s, or Broadway, for example, yeah. um, even, even in All About Eve, the play was about the South. Right. The South was, was always sort of some standard of, of, of stability of some sort. Uh, you could understand it had a class structure. Well, isn't uh, it also the fact that the South... Uh, as you say, it has a class structure, and so you can do uh, dramas about class and class issues, uh, which, which, which powered the uh, English social novel and all that kinds of other yeah. forms. And if you don't have class, uh, there's a lot fewer stories to write about. So, that, so that's why it was, well, a, it was popular for a while. If you don't do the South, you are stuck with what we call the ethnic voice. Right. Uh, Bruce J. Freeman, Philip Roth, right. Saul Bellow at its very, very best, the, the Canadian derivative of that would have been Mordecai Richler. Right, right. Um, but I, I believe it's one of the reasons that, uh, that liberals love Downton Abbey. Right. It's a class system they get their minds around, and it seems correct to them. They, of course, would all be upstairs, um, and, and the rest of us would be downstairs. But they're, they're, the thing they love about, about Downton Abbey is that it seems to be the correct world where people who know things yeah. and are smart about things sit around the manor table, and the rest of us entrust our fate to them, and that's what they think they ought to be. Is, isn't that how they uh, actually live, though? Uh, I mean, when, yeah. you, when you look at, yeah. uh, when you look at uh, Hollywood liberals, it, it's, it's like Downton Abbey uh, on the beach at Malibu, but with, with, uh, uh, but with Hispanics serving as the, in the place of the doughty English peasantry who are the below-stairs class in Downton it's Abbey. Exactly, it's exactly the world they try to build. Um, their, their license to that world, of course, is the wealth that comes with celebrity. Yeah. The celebrity culture is, is, is at the root of it. The, yeah. there's, a, there's a pecking order. Yeah. Um, and it, it has, doesn't have to do with money. Um, uh, uh, it's a, certain, certain directors might be at the very pinnacle of the heap, but basically movie stars, faces, people that walk into a restaurant, people right. recognize you, they're at the top of the heap. Right. Uh, and then there's a pecking order that goes down. There's a very, very strict understanding of the hierarchy. And I was going to write a book once called The Unwritten Rules of Hollywood Written Down, <laughs> and, and it was going to begin with the hierarchy of who belongs where, and you've got to know who you are. Um, so, so you're saying, in, in effect, the, uh, the, 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 the big-time star is, is like the, the duke, and then underneath you've got the, the, yes. produce, the directors and, and producers well, the, who are the equivalent of the marquises and uh, by and, 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 yeah. and And writers are at best baronets. <laughs> um, temporary, temporary nobility, <laughs> temporary nobility to be right, taken right. when the money runs out. Um, so the, yeah, the, the starlet who was so stupid she slept with the baronet. That's, that's right. That's yes, exactly it. right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there used to be a terrible joke about the. Uh, well, well, once it used to be a, a middle European nationality, but now I believe you say it's the blonde woman, right. the blonde woman who came to Hollywood yeah. and tried to sleep away to the top with a writer. Right. right. Um, uh, <laughs> So there was a hierarchy, and it's well understood. And so Downton Abbey is very familiar to them. They, right. they understand that. They understand, uh, from their point of view, it's a necessity. Right. But they believe they're doing good. Right. right. Shortly after we got to Hollywood, my wife and I, we, I was very friendly with Larry Gelbert, whom, yeah. whom I liked yeah. a great deal, and um, one of my wife's relatives, Gloria's, Gloria's relatives, because um, um, she has a name beyond being my wife. She was an actress, a very successful one. 
I mean, we spent time, they worked on MASH, one of her relatives. Yeah. It was a huge of MASH. So we spent a lot of time around the MASH people. When we first came, they were very kind and generous. And we were at somebody's house one evening, and they were talking about their work. And uh, one of the women who worked, she was the note girl, who was the, the genius they needed to take down the notes at the meeting, she said, we got a letter the other day from a Korean veteran who said he saw an episode that they all recognized. And how joyous it made him feel. He related to it. And went about the guy had seen it, liked it, and wrote a fan right. letter. And she said, I realized how fortunate we are to be engaged in bringing light and happiness into the drab little lives of ordinary people. So, so as pretty much an ordinary person myself, I mean, I, Larry Galbert kind of looked away. I, I, I got his eye. I mean, he understood. But Alan Alder was nodding. Yes, I understand. I really shouldn't tell names. My wife says I shouldn't drop names. But, but there was a feeling, for example, yeah. in that show, that they were doing... They were doing much more than a television show. Right, right. They were purveyors of good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and and uh, an enlightening force within the, the community. Yeah. Um, uh, be, be, befitting and deserving the approbation of, and, and admiration of everyone around them. It was a genuine feeling. It wasn't, this is not a fraudulent thing. They really... No, no, no. La Larry Gelbart was uh, in incredibly successful. He came out of the Sid Caesar show. Um, I, uh, I ran across him over the years, mainly in connection with the musicals. Yeah. Uh, he he funny, worked A funny on, thing happened. He, and, a funny yeah. thing happened on the way to form all the way up to, I think, City of Angels yeah. in the 90s was his last one. He was a very uh, great writer. I, I, kind of, I never talked politics with him because I kind of always assumed he was, uh, had conventional views. As you would as you would say, but I I, I saw Tootsie, which he wrote, uh, yep. the uh, for the first time in twenty years or whatever, with, with Dustin Hoffman, uh, who in order uh, an unemployed actor who in order to get a job pretends to be a woman right. and gets the female role on a daytime soap opera, and it's an hilarious film, and I can't help thinking now that if uh, Larry Gelbart had had to write that film today. He'd be walking on eggshells, lest oh. he uh, lest he offended all. He was accused of transphobia uh, by all the trans friendly crowd. In other words, if you're, uh, you can never be. If you once you accept uh, those kind of premises, you can never keep up. Uh, you'll you'll you, you you'll always fall afoul of some new rule if you try to yes. uh, con concede those. Um. He, he was a very, in fact, I would wonder if Larry was around now, how he'd feel about this. I don't know. He's, he was a very, very bright man, but one of the, one of the few true writers right. in Hollywood. There aren't a lot of them. I mean, basically, it's a, it's a um, well, there is no such thing as art. There's craft, right. and, and there are a few good craftsmen whose work gets to that level. He was right. one of them. Right. But he, he and I were very friendly. We talked politics a great deal, even though we were on vastly. We even, he even agreed to a couple of, uh, we did panels together yeah. occasionally. Um, but no, you couldn't do Tootsie today. It's, it's interesting. Um, uh, Frank, Frank Price, who ran the studio, yeah. who carefully put that together, uh, would Sidney Pollock, he, he said he, he had to get Sidney Pollock, he has his reasons for it, doing a documentary about it. It's very interesting, yeah. actually. I don't think Sidney Pollock would take that were he alive. You know, he had blessed memory. Yeah. Um, because it, he, you couldn't get by that. Then they'd be arguing, well, should that be played by a, a cisgender? Cisgender, yeah. right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Cis, yeah. I love that. Came across yeah. that first with uh, with Redmond's fantastic, uh, the Danish girl. Right. It was a wonderful performance. Uh, it was uh, criticized by a lot of people in Hollywood because, well, why did they not hire a real transvestite? I have no idea. Right. Presumably, mm -hmm. there are transvestite acting classes as opposed to regular. You would go to that class to find them. Um, but you're right. Um, well, that, I actually know a. Uh, I'm surprised because I, uh, but I actually. Uh, a, Known for a long time, a uh, I won't go into too many details. A transgendered actress, whose only screen work uh, she can get is playing drag queens, which of course is incredibly insulting. That's uh, very ironic. Uh, when, when you've gone, when you again, without wishing to get into uh, too much of the ins and outs, when you've gone the whole way, <laughs> you're basically all they're offering you is basically yeah. Third drag queen from the left in La Cage au Fall. It's tremendously insulting. And, and the gods laugh. You yeah, see, yeah, that's very yeah, ironic. Yeah, she, yeah. she made that. Yeah. Um, the, 
the, the rules of what you can write and what you can't write. Now, there are those, you see, it's a, it's a very big business. Yeah, it's yeah. a very small community. Yeah. Um, I wanted to do something for some. I, I hate Nora Ephron's films. Okay. <laughs> I hope she watches your show. I doubt it, but I hope she does. Um, she always makes these mythical, strong women who discover 1940s films with those strong women. Right, right, and yeah. it's true. In the 40s and 50s, women carried films. Bette Davis, Joan Crawford yeah. could carry a film. You couldn't do Mildred Pierce today. There's no actress of that, of that, uh, that prominence or with that support in, uh, with that brought an audience. <laughs> Certainly not Meryl Streep, who was uh, uh, deified for her craft. Um, uh, but um, the, the, uh, I wanted to do something about where a Nora Ephron type, Tina, Tina Brown, someone like that, right. meets a real person, meets one of the strong men that she right. wishes was still there. And, <laughs> and I'd worked out a story where, where a Tina Brown type uh, gets herself embedded with a ready reserve group, uh, Marines coming back. Right, right. From, right. from overseas. So they're really civilians. They're really interesting guys because often the sergeant yeah. has a better civilian job than the major. Yeah, yeah. You know, the yeah, ready yeah. reserves. No, so, there's, a, there's a funny, because it is a sub, uh, there, there's a, there was for a while a sub-genre where uh, people like Diane Keaton would play like a Manhattan woman who gets sick of the city. So she comes to rural Vermont and she meets yes. a guy who drives a, a truck, but he's a sensitive. He can, he can build her a cabin in the woods, but he also quotes poetry. That's I think right, Sandra yeah. Bullock and Harry Connick made <laughs> yeah. one like that. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, um, and, it's, and, and, it, and you don't know what's quite what's going on there, but you sense that uh, at heart, uh, somewhere deep down, every feminist woman knows that the new male is not a satisfactory right. life shave. partner. They, they're not some of these things where you can look unshaven. The yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a cousin, though, I believe. I've I yeah. noticed those films. Those are the kind of films I hate. Yeah. They are related to... Um, the, uh, a spate of films that, that, that appeared in the 19, late 60s, early 70s, uh, Bridge Too Far, right. that always included um, a sensitive German officer, you right. know, right. Horst Buchholz, and I don't, I yeah. just wish they wouldn't do this to the Jews, you know. Yeah. But yeah. other than that, he was like a good man. He was just yeah. caught up in it. Oh, yeah. no, I don't like the Nazis, but I'm a German. Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the yeah. sensitive Nazi, Oscar Werner, yes. made a fortune yeah, playing right. that role. A cultured man. Uh, yes, a cultured man. China, yes, as he's sending right. you right. off to the camp. Right. It's precisely, precisely, precisely. <laughs> Oh, it's just so sad. Um, uh, and I think that that's a cousin of that. Right. The, 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 it's an attempt to normalize uh, what is abnormal, make it, make it controllable, make it... It's part of this thing I have about Hollywood can only understand evil uh, if, if it's seen in ourselves. You, you right. can't make a film where the Nazis are the bad guys. You have to have a Nazi-like American. So, oh, I understand now what evil is. It's really in us. It's, that's, that's right. And that's the same kind of thing they're trying to do. They're, they're trying to say, well, that's... That's what I would have been in Nazi Germany. Well, since, since you, you mentioned uh, the sensitive uh, officer type, um, I, should, I should mention that uh, you served uh, in the Canadian Army. You, yes, were, I did. Mem you were in the uh, Black Watch, which is a very I... uh, storied regiment, had the dear old Queen Mum as Colonel in Chief. Uh, Sen Senior many Highland years. Regiment in the Canadian Army, yes. Yep, and, uh, and uh, uh, that. Remember. That's that's unusual. Yeah, you've you've you've, yeah. you've 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 still got that on your lapel. Yes. The um, that's does that make you unusual in Hollywood? At one time, it made me unique. Oh. Um, there are more and more that have emerged. What was interesting? We, we a group formed. I started having lunches with. I, I met Gary Sinise uh, right. backstage at the show, and uh, he was doing some wonderful work for Operation Iraqi yeah. Children, and rendered that. And, Slowly but surely, we became friends, and he began yeah. speaking politics with me. And he's a 9 11 -er. I mean, right. never really considered his politics until 9 11, and became very unhappy. And he, he, he was the inspiration, really, for uh, um, he and I formed a group called, called, became known as Friends of Abe. Yep, yep, I, Very uh, famous. We yep. have now two and a half thousand people. And um, I'd always tried to form. Uh, groups to storm the ramparts. You see, we had the Wednesday Morning Club with David Horowitz, you right. know, Excelsior. You know, right. David being having once been a red diaper baby was perfect for right. me. Uh, and but Gary uh, said, No, 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 forget that. People, don't, we won't give them a spear. Let's give them a seat. Yeah. And he created this environment that was of, of his. His he conceived this. John Boy used to say, "We're all really somewhere inside Gary. This is Gary. The inside of Gary Sinise's mind, where you could come." And just be where who you were and what you were, and we'd go down the table like alcoholics. Yeah, uh, and each would tell their story like yeah. AA. 
And it was amazing then how many people would admit, in faltering terms, l looking around furtively, that they'd been in the service. Right. Um, but, but when first I came to Hollywood in the late 70s, to have been in the military, to have any sympathy for the military was, I mean, I, I was, ugh, I almost got into a fight at, at a party. I used to constantly be because I, I um, um, you know, I'm on the board of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial's yeah. National Sponsoring Committee. And I defended the Vietnam veterans. In fact, I defended the Vietnam War, right. which was really <laughs> unthinkable. And when I suggested that Kennedy had started the war, and that uh, I, uh. I actually got to do Kissinger and Nixon at one point based on Walter Isaacson's right. book, and the crawl said it. And I had a huge fight with uh. Danny Petrie about it, whether I could put this I wanted to say. When he came to office, we had uh, 1.4 million men when yeah. Nixon came to office in Vietnam. By the end of his first term, it was down to, I think, 175,000. Nixon ended that war. It was yeah. not Nixon's war. No. no. Um, though, of course, that's being rewritten. Yeah, yeah. Parenthetically, I see Ken Burns is now doing a documentary on the uh, Vietnam War, and I can just imagine what that is going to be. It will be, um, you know, his obsession with racism and his obsession yeah. with progressivism no, no. will be a complete rewriting of that. I don't, I don't even mm. want to get into Ken Burns, because no, no, after what he did to jazz... Uh, he made the world's dullest series on uh, jazz, partly because of his political obsession. Well, because so he, he, he has to see everything in America as something white people stole from blacks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jazz, the genius of jazz, it was a fusion. It was yeah, yeah, no, no. Uh, rock and roll. No, no that was no, stolen no. from blacks. Baseball was stolen. I mean, there's nothing. Um, no. um, racial obsession is... It's, it's, yeah, uh, but I don't, I don't, um, it's like, I, I, you know, there's certain things, when I'm weighing the merits of Artie Shaw and Duke Ellington, I don't want their skin pigmentation uh, to be the issue. I mean, I think that... Oh, I how think quaint of you. I think that's, uh, I think <laughs> how that's, quaint. Like, I think that's kind of, but, but, but just, just to return to, to yeah, this... It was the, unique at that time. This, uh, the, this, this black watch thing. Yeah. Uh, because... Um, they participated, and, and you were aware of this as, uh, I don't know what you, whether you were a private or a corporal or whatever you were. Um, I ended I mean, up a corporal, right? <laughs> a corporal. Walking soldier one, one night, but that other than that, uh, good but, soldier. Uh, but, but they had taken a part in uh, uh, one of the most thankless uh, missions of the Second World War. Uh, and as a young private or corporal in the Black Watch in Canada, you knew about this. Dieppe. We were speaking mm. of Dieppe. Uh, Dieppe was uh, Dieppe was Canada's coming of age. Uh, well, there were two. You could, in World War Two. There was World War One. Yeah. Canada raised the largest army in the world in yeah. World War Two to fight yeah. Hitler per capita. Yeah. One point four million people under arms for a nation of eleven million. Yeah, no, nobody no, matched no, that. Yeah, and nobody and nobody knows that. And 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 it's <laughs> it's and even Canadians don't know mm. that because well, uh, the Canadians think uh, oh we've just been always been peacekeepers. So. No, yeah. Well, I blame entirely I, a man I knew, who I mean, whom I knew well and who was very gracious to me at times with Pierre Leonard Trudeau right. destroyed that. Yeah. The, the last, I worked at Expo 67. I, be, I began right. as a laborer, actually. I ended right. up number three guy in the entertainment branch. Uh, my title was a Director of Reproduction for Man in His World, which <laughs> was a wonderful card to hand out at a, as a young <laughs> man. Je suis le directeur de reproduction de l'homme des terres des Does that work know? with uh, young Montreal ladies? Here's my <laughs> card, I'm Director of Reproduction. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah. Be nice to me. Um, uh, uh, so I, I was, uh, um, um, uh, and, and I remember that summer, right. yeah. as the summer of Expo 67, and, as the last summer of what I consider to be my Canada. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, 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 it was interesting. It was back about Montreal for one of the anniversaries, and it was all about Trudeau that, on that day. Right. And yet, Lester Pearson was a prime minister. He'd been yeah. totally ignored yeah. and forgotten. Yeah. But that was a Canada that didn't care about the Americans. They would sort of be amused by them in their, with their cameras yeah. and their short pants uh, when yeah. they came to Montreal. Yeah. Um, we... We were a very broad-shouldered, self-reliant country right. uh, who knew who we were, uh, and we're very proud to be who we were. Yeah. And then Dieppe had been part of that. In 1942, the, the Americans, the Yanks, had only just joined the war. Um, uh, Hitler had invaded the Soviet Union, and now the left was saying, oh, we've got to get in this war, right. after having opposed it until right. then. And they wanted a... Uh, and, and, and Stalin was screaming for a second front. The logic of it was that having been attacked by Japan, yeah. most of America's resources would go to the South Pacific in defeating Japan. But in fact, they were indeed turned to Europe. Yeah. And that was a gesture to, to Stalin. The first thing, he wanted to open a second front. Well, 
The question is, there were only two ways you could do that. Did you have to have a beachhead? You could either take a fortified port where you had all the davits and the docks and the things you needed to move tanks and what have you through, or you'd have to go to a place like Normandy where there are flat beaches and, and, yeah. and assault the beaches that would take amphibious craft in many years. Yeah. So they decided to test an, a, a taking a fortified port in Dieppe. It was called, Dieppe was to be the place. Right. And the Canadians were chosen to do it. The, the, uh, the Australians and New Zealanders, um, they, they, were, they were all stuck in the South Pacific and they didn't really have any units to give to Europe. Uh, the Canadians had taken a terrible beating. Uh, the, uh, the Royal Rifles at Quebec at, uh, at uh, the defense of Hong Kong right. lost right. several thousand men. But so Dieppe fell to the Canadians. 1,000 British commandos, I think, were added, and 100 U.S. Rangers yeah. attached to a rifle regiment. Yeah. And so they were berets, yeah. green berets. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was a disaster. It was uh, Mountbatten commanded the operation, yeah. uh, James Bond. Uh, creator Ian Fleming was the intelligence officer. There's a book by David O'Keefe now, The Black Watch, that says the commandos had a separate job, which was to get the, the Enigma machine. Right. It was there. The code breaking. Yeah. yeah. But it was disastrously planned. They put all the men on the boats uh, on a Friday night, I think it was, or anyway, two nights before the invasion, and um, briefed them down to the uh, senior NCO level. So yeah. everyone knew where they were going. Right. They knew the name, they knew what was up. And they gave them you know, 48 hours leave with money in their pocket. Presumably because they would have thought that a huge invasion the Germans would know about and therefore they weren't really too worried. Perhaps they were encouraging yeah. leaks. I have no idea. The fascinating thing was that not one Canadian failed to report. They all came back on the Sunday night knowing that this was... Yes, it was a doomed mission doomed. And, they doomed. and they gave them the option to check out. Yes, they, everyone could have gone over the wall. <clears throat> yeah. They didn't. The French leave, as we called it. No. They didn't. They all came back and they went. And um, uh, 4,800 Canadians, 68% losses. It was a, a disaster for Canada. 40, 40, I mean, think of this now. We're, we're losing you know, over 4,000 people, 4,000 men in a country of 11 million. I mean, that's well, there's about 180,000 Americans in one yeah, afternoon. Yeah. It's, it was, I mean, it, 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 it's literally in, inconceivable. Fusilli and Montréal were cut down, murdered on the mole where they, where they were stuck. It yeah. was uh, an inconceivable defeat. And yeah. Um, yeah. one of the great stories is the Germans were shocked that when they, they took a unit, the P, Princess Patricia's Canadian Infantry, right. Infantry, they said, move on, move on. And they, the officers called them into attention, put them in line, and they sang off singing, I don't want to, I don't want no more of army life, Gino, I want to go back to Ontario. Right. And they thought, my God, who are these people? It was a very brave moment for Canada and yeah. it was a terrible time of mourning. Um, I and tried, and you know, as you say, these are all, I mean, they don't mean, uh, these names don't mean a lot in the United States, but the uh, Princess Patricia's, are again, a very yeah. storied uh, yes. regiment in Canadian history. And so this one Dieppe raid, the, the deaths from it uh, penetrated basically every community uh, yeah. from Newfoundland uh, to British Columbia. Yes. Uh, some units had terrible losses to uh, uh, a Highland Regiment in Nova Scotia, to the, also to the Hamilton Light Infantry, the yeah. Black Watch was there, yeah. the South Saskatchewans. Yeah. It, was, it was a disaster. Um, wonderful poem written by Mona Gould. Uh, who was on CJ, CBC, CJBC in Toronto. Right. She had a morning show. Right. Uh, this is my brother at Dieppe, who quietly, like a hero, right. gave his life. Right. Yeah, I find it very moving, I think, of right. the whole poem, right. Right. Uh, how he died. Um, kids from Saskatchewan dying for the freedom of people they knew nothing about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kids from, from, from Ontario had no reason to die on a French beach. No other than a call of duty to, to something bigger than themselves and larger. It's a right. great moment in Canadian history that's absolutely totally forgotten. Yeah. Stamped uh, out by Trudeau, <clears throat> stamped out by the people who, who, who say there should be no, no countries, no borders. Right. The five right. no's of the Marxist, of, of the manifesto. Right. No, no countries, uh, no money, no right. family, no individuality, and no religion. That was no. the fifth. But it, and in the end, it makes a difference uh, that that uh, Canadians, uh, I mean, when they eventually got on top of things and they did of D-Day, uh, people forget that now, but the, uh, the five beaches, two were American, three fell to the British Empire, which meant that Canadians uh, got uh, Juneau Beach uh, all to themselves. Right, we uh, really had, uh, 
really two beaches, actually. Yeah. We, um, uh, Thirty percent of the troops that landed were. Right. were Canadian. I did um, one, a film I did not too long ago, actually, with Tom Selleck playing Eisenhower called. Uh, right. Called Ike Countdown to D-Day. We called it Thunder in June, but the, yeah, yeah. the studio thought, no, Ike Countdown to D-Day. Right. It was just the five days before, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. looked at for five days. And um, I made sure that a lot of his general officers were in black watch. Right. You see the film. Right, right. Confusion of black watch shoulder patches. Were you? Um, but <clears throat> when I walked into the, um, um, to the art department and they had the map, they were right. using the map, they had a little Canadian, you know, the, maple, the, the red maple leaf. Flag. Right, right. Which was supposed to be two blue panels with it, but never mind right, what it was right, supposed right. to be. And I said, "That's not the Canadian flag." No, no, there, look, look, there it is. There it is. The, <laughs> so, the old, uh, well, the old, uh, the old red ensign. That's it. Well, the red ensign. And as we and, we, and as we've detailed I saw before, your that's yeah. the, the, the maple leaves are green because uh, in the Second World War, uh, on the red ensign, they were green. They were green. And I saw your cup as well, yeah, which I, yeah, yeah. I was almost going to steal it, but <laughs> I just wanted your staff to do great. Yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but the, um, uh, he, he, Pierre hated the regiment. Right. I, I once said to him, I said, you, he said, we, we need to look like a modern army. Yeah. yeah and he invented those yeah. green uniforms with the stripe. Yeah, yeah. We had someone invent it. I said, the history of Canada is yeah. really told in its regiments. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the 78th Highlanders, which is, yeah. I hold an honor, a captaincy, it's an honorary regiment. Right, right, right. right. Um, yeah. For a guy who joined as a private with a grade eight education, they've done yeah. me well. I'm an, uh, an honorary member, of the, yeah. associate member of the, the officer's mess. I yeah. like to go and pretend I'm an officer. Yeah. Um, but that was a regiment that took Quebec, and then the year yeah. later took yeah. Montreal, yeah. and then they stood them down, and yeah. they became, because Canada's not an English-French country, it's a Scottish-French country, right. Right. Uh, which right. is not understood even by Canadians anymore. No. Um, uh, no, everything, was built, everything in the country built by the Hudson's Bay Company, Canadian mm -hmm. Pacific Railroad. You go to the Mount... Royal Club and look at the pictures of Lord Strathcona and come on the They're all Scotsmen. Yeah, mm. yeah, yes. Yeah. The people who built the railways, Canada was built, yeah. except Toronto, which were the people, that, the Tories that came, yeah. that yeah. fled the revolution. Um, but Toronto was a tiny town. And no, no, no. The great tragedy of Canada has been the growth of Toronto. But, anyway. <laughs> but you, you <laughs> now a, this, but this <laughs> Dieppe raid, in, yeah. th in theory, it's like you, you mentioned A Bridge Too Far and those kind of films they, uh, they made in the 60s and 70s. You pitched the Dieppe raid yes, as a did. film because it, although it's mostly Canadians, you've got some British, so you could have yeah. like Hugh Grant doing his shtick, and, and you've got like some Americans, yeah. so you could have Matt Damon or whoever, uh, and you've got like some, uh, and as you said, it was a pretty much a disaster, and you've got like uh, Lord Mountbatten, so you can have the uh, the uh, the English aristocrat who isn't quite up to the job. And the and, Bogart of Bridge Too Far. That's yeah. right, that's right. And you've got <coughs> Ian Fleming there. And now you actually yeah. wound up pitching this uh, yeah. in, a, uh, in a meeting. I forget what studio it was, but the... Um, I, don't, I never mentioned this. You studio. never mentioned Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so I give you thought I'd hold his name, but no, I... Uh, was, but, um, but, but you, but uh, you so you, you, you pitched that to mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Uh, and it's a... It's a it's a it's a great movie idea, and and the line that was delivered to you in response to it actually tells you everything you need to know about yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Well, there we were. I had the whole. It was a very. It was a kind of pitch they'd heard about because yeah. I told it earlier. I had the whole development department there, and I gave the pitch, and I did it well, and and every, there was tears in the eyes at the end of it, and the um, the head of development just she she turned and. I mean, she was deeply troubled. She'd been moved, and she looked out the window, and you could see the. I mean, it was this perfect moment, right. a Hollywood moment, right. where you hear the whoosh of the air conditioning, and right, right. you could hear the crackle of the Pellegrino. Right. You know? <laughs> and she turns back and says, "Unbelievable!" She said, "These, these generals, these bloodthirsty generals, right. sent our boys to a certain death." Right. So it was not certain, probable, but not certain. I, right. Right. She said, "Ah, oh, terrible." I said, "No, no, no. They, they." They cried for their men. Kurar cried. It was a terrible thing. It was like Ike saying goodbye to the to the jumpers on D Day. It yeah. was uh, yeah. it's a price of war. Yeah. Churchill said that because of Dieppe, Normandy was a success. I mean, it was a terrible price paid by Canadians for a much more important and greater victory. Right. And no generals, no bad generals. I said no. I said you know misguided, but not bad men. No. Yeah. I said well then who who's the enemy of the peace? So Hitler and the Nazis. He said, no, 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 I mean the real enemy. 
and I, <laughs> I freaked out. I tipped over a table. Yeah. Um, and, but that tells you she could only understand Nazism yeah. as a cipher for the evil within us. Right. right. So that if you then say there is a Muslim problem, yeah. which is a statement of fact, yeah. it is not that Muslims are a problem, but that Islam, when exported to the West, brings with it problems that right. you have to deal with. Right. They have to identify, in order to grasp that evil, yeah. they have to say, well, well, where's evil? Oh, I know. It's because you don't like them and you hate them. No, I don't hate them. I'm concerned about what we're doing. No, no, you must hate them. It, it, it. But, but as I think about your line in, in the years since 9-11, it's, it's, it, and it comes back to me whenever I sit through a movie that is ostensibly about now, about yeah. today, um, whereby uh, it appears, you, you, know, you know this now, you can set your clock by it, that if ever there appears to be a film that is about Muslim terrorism, in the end, the guy behind it turns out to be, be white supremacist. the vice president of Halliburton who's yeah. uh, secretly keeping this thing going in order to bulk yeah. up his profits or whatever. And that has become uh, such a, 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 a cliche. You wonder if, if they were making Casablanca... Well, I think that was... They did some Tom Clancy book and they changed it, as you said, to... White supremacists. From, from Islamic. Yes, yes white some supremacists. of all fairs that was, or whatever. Yes, yeah. and that was, uh, um, uh, her, uh, what's his name? Uh, Ken Olin's old partner. Anyway, um, it'll yeah. come back to me. Uh, so it's like if they'd Prince been doing Phil, yeah. Casablanca and uh, yeah, they'd have removed the Nazis and made them elderly British redcoats or something. I mean, it's like, it's yeah, not yeah, Colonel Blimps. Yeah, in it's fact, nuts it's, to, uh, what, 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 I mean, what, what is well, going on? It, 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 now that um, the Donald Trump has been elected, yeah. for which I'm grateful every day, right. um, you won't see so many bad businessmen. It'll be our government. It'll be we ourselves. Right. They can get to the truth of it. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, because there was a cadre of people, I believe, who came there. Paula Weinstein, who was a producer of some note, yeah. said, I came here to make Marxist movies. Yeah. I think she, I once heard her say she was sent here. Or Bob Duval did, did a movie with Bobby so Duval. So she's a deep sleeper. <laughs> yes, I did. I did a movie with with Bobby Duval, Robert Duval. Uh, he played Eichmann. He was brilliant, and um, um, we got into an interesting conversation because I had replaced another writer, and uh, that, who had missed the point of it. And the point of it was that uh, that Eichmann had been waiting for 16 years. He knew the Jews were coming. Right. Jews from New York, Israelis, but he knew one day there'd be a hand on his shoulder saying, hello, we're here. Right. And he had prepared for that for all of the yeah. time since the war. Whereas the Mossad agent who was with him in the room while, where he was held while they waited to get him out of the country never dreamed in a million years that he would yeah. be in a room with Eichmann. So that's an inversion. Yeah. The captive yeah. doesn't know why he's yeah. got the guy and the captive yeah. is prepared. Yeah. And, um, and uh, Bob Duval, who had left, was going to leave the film, and then he said, well, you know, get him to write it, and they did, and I wrote it. And he said, I'm doing it. This is it. This is what we should be doing. And we got into a very long discussion about what is truth. Huh. Uh, because he said, you know, I, I can only play Eichmann if I play his truth. Right. He was not a bad man to himself. Right, right. right. And it, it's quite a remarkable performance. It really yeah. is. called yeah. The Man no. Who Captured Eichmann. And just, no, no, it is. And, no, he's, yeah. and he's right, of course, that uh, the, the, the villain... Uh, in, in, except in very rare circumstances, evil men think they are good men and, yeah. they, and they have their uh, truth for what they're doing. And yes, and, and they can justify it, and, mm. and they're kind of surprised you don't understand it, at least yeah. to the, well, can't we agree to disagree? I was just yeah. following orders, they weren't people. Um, and um, I, I've had three mentors in my life that looked at one of them was Bob Fosse, who was... Yeah who was absolutely a stickler on two things that I learned from him. One is, there's no art, you know, you can talk about art, it's good, but the truth is, is craft. You learn your craft, yeah. you, learn, you learn how to make a cabinet, and if you're really good at it and you do a lot of it and you work very hard, you're gonna make a great cabinet, yeah. and you may become Sheraton, who knows. Right. Um, but it's only craft, and the other thing is truth. He said the hardest place to find truth is casting. Yeah. He said, if you're gonna cast a gay man, he said, I have to cast a guy whom I would want to have an affair with if I were gay. He right. said, I have to make that movement in my head. Right. Yeah. Um, but in a celebrity-dominated community like Hollywood, that's the first 
the first uh, 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 casualty of truth. Right. right. In the old studio system, they say, well, okay, I want a movie for Joan yes. Crawford. And so you'll get a film like Mildred Pierce. Right. I keep coming back to Mildred Pierce. I hadn't seen it. I was like, <laughs> it was one of those films that everyone says, oh, brilliant film that no one had ever seen. Right. And I saw it <coughs> on an Air Canada flight. It was sensational. No, it is. Amazing no, film. No, no, no. Just an amazing film. There's no real equivalent mm. to a, a Joan Crawford type. So uh, you could no. There's no woman no. out there like. There's no woman even like, like like Bette Davis. I mean, no, can, can you no. can you imagine? No. Can you imagine trying to do? Of course, they're always trying to remake uh, uh, All About Eve. Yeah, yeah. But can you imagine I mean, who who would you cast in that? No, no. Well, and then, like there were there was talk. I think there was a talk about a Casablanca. Uh, <laughs> with, I think I've, they did it for, excuse me. I think they did it for TV. I, I forget. I, I, but they, they like they talk about these things all the time. Again, it's that, you know, what you want in this age, and that, that's why I hope one day this Dieppe gets gets made because, um, you know, what you want is like that moment in Casablanca when they all stand up and sing La Marseillaise, mm. and they're just ordinary. French people in a, a nightclub, but they they viscerally understand, uh, in, in a primal sense, that they're on the they're on the right side, and they and they're happy to let it be known. And you can't imagine Hollywood actually uh, making uh, filming a scene like that. Uh, no, because to understand that, that scene as you've described mm. it is a dynamic between good and evil. You you have to accept yeah. that there are such yeah. things. Yeah. In, at times, in absolute terms, good and evil, and that's not acceptable in Hollywood because they live in a twilight. Yeah. They live in a twilight. Um, I, should, I suppose. I, I mean, look, there are very good people in Hollywood that do nothing but, but want to have you know take their kids to Little League and, and what yeah, have yeah. you. And, but in general, particularly at a time in life, at the early point where you're making your career, it's 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 a clouded morality. Yeah. It's a clouded sense of decency. Um, the very successful people in Hollywood are not necessarily very successful because they're talented. In fact, you might say, you, you gotta be lucky. Right. There's a great deal of good fortune. And that haunts many of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because deep down they don't. They, so I meet Bob Fosse, okay? Yeah. It's just like, this was the most amazing thing. And this says it all. And he, he hadn't given any interviews yeah. and I was going, I was, it was the writer's strike, and we just moved back to the States. And I'd left, I'd left, I had been, yeah, I left Auto Premature. I did, I quit, yeah. but he'd made my life a misery. And I, it, it, Bob Fosse, my agent's assistant and his assistant were roommates, and yeah. she got me a 20 minute interview. Yeah. Turned out to be six hours. I sat yeah. with him all night virtually. Um, uh, but he was going to give me 20 minutes. I said, May I record it? Yeah, yeah, yeah record it. I put it down, lit a cigarette because he's a yeah. Yeah. chain smoker, and he said, Go ahead. I said, okay, I, I, I want to begin with, you know, how did you feel? You won the Oscar, the Tony, the Emmy, all in the past year. Yeah. It'll never happen again because of yeah. time. I said, how did you feel? He said, uh, well, I planned my suicide. I said, listen, give me 20 minutes. I need, <laughs> I need five quotes and I can sell this for seven and a half grand to Playboy. Right. And he says, I just told you the truth. Yeah. He says, don't you understand? Now when they discover I'm a fraud, yeah. it's going to be complete humiliation. Yeah. Yeah. And I realized that he meant it. Yeah. He really, we talked about that for quite a while, yeah. this, this fraud complex. Right. And I think it haunts everyone I know in Hollywood. Yeah. Even if they're not aware of it, they recognize that, um, I mean, one of the things I liked about La La Land was that was perfect. She puts on a play, right. I, 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 it's a spoiler, yeah. uh, forgive yeah, me. Yeah, plot, plot, plot spoiler, because yeah. it's uh, fairly late in the picture. Yeah, uh, maybe I shouldn't know, but, yeah. but it is so accidental that the one person yeah. who might change her life happens to walk in there out of the rain, presumably. Right, right. right. And that changes her life. Yeah. yeah. And that's basically the story. I don't know, I know very, there was a time, it was a studio system, you'd go in and you'd work your way up and there, I still, not in a long time, but I remember when I first got out there, there were people who said, I began as a page at NBC in New York and they'd work their way up and somehow yeah, they'd yeah. find their way. But that isn't the case anymore. No, no, it's it's, it's luck. I, I, uh, I didn't know Bob Fosse as well as as you did, but he did. Uh, I I met him briefly, um, and as you say, he had a, like a terrific uh, run for a while at the time. He had uh, cab, well, Chicago, which wasn't a big hit in Broadway at the time, then came Cabaret, back and yeah. became a huge movie and. Huge uh, movie. 
uh, and, and Cabaret. And all uh, that jazz. And all that so jazz. And, and Lenny. Star uh, 80. And, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, and, yeah. and then, as you say, his uh, TV special with uh, Liza, Liza Minnelli. Yeah. And he, uh, the sense I got, uh, I got from him, he didn't quite spell it out like this, but he described himself, uh, he said, uh, I'd got his age wrong in the way you do when you're young. I'd said yeah. breezily to him, oh, you're now 60 years old or whatever. And he said, do you mind, I'm, uh, I'm actually 58 right. or whatever. He said, give an old song and dance man a break. Mm -hmm. and, he, and in a sense, he thought of himself like that, that he knew certain crafts uh, obviously choreography and, right. uh, and, uh, and he knew, and because he knew certain crafts, uh, if you put them, if you put them with the right property, he could tell that story brilliantly. Right. But he understood, um, that there's an element of, uh, happy accident to that. And when you have like a perfect year that will never come again for anybody where you win, you know, right. the Oscar, the Tony, the Emmy, uh, all in this, all in twelve months, and everybody thinks you're, you, you know, you're the colossus who bestrides the planet. In the end, he knows, he knows how to do half a dozen things, and if you yoke them with the right property, you make magic. But there's there's a sort of that's luck, and that's you know, and that's all. Sweet Charity was not the right film for him. It no. would have been precast for him. And but you're right. It is. Although it's, he did everything he did, yeah, that's that's makes more. Yeah. He did everything he did in cabaret, but it just didn't work in Street It didn't Charity. work because it was right. the wrong casting, whatever right. it was. He was he certainly understood that that yeah. was uh, yeah. It is. It's always a happy accident. And of course, the other thing that he said, which I, I never put in the profile, which eventually I did write and sell and yeah. supported me for a year, what yeah. I made on that one, um, uh, that the thing that he also understood when it settled down and that he'd had this amazing year that he would now be he really hated for it, that this would, yeah. that he, he, yes, there would be this sort of awe thing that would go on. Right. But right. in general, he would be resented. Um, and I don't know why he felt that way, because certainly so <coughs> people like Scorsese have managed to yeah. uh, maintain their godlike status. But I don't think Scorsese is as good as, as Bob yeah, Fosse, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is, by the way, if that gets out in Hollywood, I'll never work <laughs> yeah. again. Don't he's, worry, we'll... He's a godhead. Yeah, we'll um, cut that bit out. But, <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me no. ask you just... Just finally, Lionel, because you, you wrote recently, uh, you revisited this subject of the yeah. Dieppe raid. Uh, and I'd heard the story about the pitch before and everything, but you added something to it this time round, which I found very moving. Going back to when you were a, yeah. a corporal in the Black Watch, and you'd asked your sergeant about this uh, bets, uh, yeah. uh, back in a, a bar on the Rue Saint Catherine in Montreal yeah. somewhere. The Regent, the Regent Tavern, actually, just really? <laughs> next to the Alouette Theatre. Yeah. Okay, okay, that's it really good. happened. That story. That's good. Pitting it, uh. pitting it down, and you asked him whether the, the Dieppe raid had happened and whether all those guys uh, had... I asked him why. Yeah, yeah. Because I wondered why, and mm. I first I said, that, you know, Sergeant, I, I, cause I, he was my Sergeant, I don't even know why he was sitting with us, yeah. about eight of us at the table. I said, Sergeant, I, I got a question about Dieppe. He just looked at me like, yeah. who do you think you are? You yeah. know, you're yeah. corporal. He, he said nothing, and I just, I felt, I said, but I, I, I'm, it's not a war story I'm looking for. I, I have a question, one, he looked at me, he said, all right, corporal, I'll give you one question. I said, there were only you guys, it was us, there were Brits, there were Yanks, yeah. All oh, you Canadians, you all came back. He said, why? I said, why? Not one guy? Yeah. <laughs> Figured he'll say, I'm sorry, I'm too drunk, I missed it, and get 30 days, or maybe not get anything. Right. He said, well, he says, that's a trouble. He said, uh, we were kind of living in a world where you had to figure out where it was going and what it was worth living for. So we came back and we raised a generation of kids like you, was the, was the implication. Yeah. Uh, we just want to give you everything that we never had. We wanted life yeah. to be perfect for you. Yeah. And so now all you care about is what you're living for. Yeah. In our world, we had to figure out that living in a world full of Nazis wouldn't be worth living at all, yeah. which meant it had to be worth dying for. Right. So our right. question is, what do you die for? Yours is, what are you living for? Right. right. That's why we came back. Right, right. And I mean, it was... <laughs> I was uh, 18, maybe. It was yeah. a sudden insight into the thinking. I mean, the, 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 yeah. the men of his, he was probably 21 then. Yeah, these, these were all understand young guys. that issue. Yeah. They were young guys, but, but who made that conscious decision. Canada's army yeah. was nearly all 
nearly all volunteers. No, no, and they were 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 but yeah. they were men. And in some cases, they were 15 years old who pretended to be of age, but they were still men. They really had to, it wasn't, they were men. They yeah. were men because they, 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 they understood where they stood in the cosmos, yeah. not just on their street. Yeah. But they, this had to be something worth dying for. I, I have one little story about, about how we've simplified everything to bumper stickers. Yeah. The great slogan is now, be something bigger than yourself. Right. Hollywood's full of people who say, oh, I support the troops. That's yeah. one of the things I'm working. I'm actually working for FX I, yeah. on, on this. I mean, which is amazing that that yeah. buyer, Eric Shaw, is an amazing buyer. Yeah. He, he, he will put me to work on what I want to do. Yeah. Okay, I, I, I'm going to tell you this one story about how words get devalued. I support the troops. Really, what do you do? Yeah. I just said I support the troops. Oh, you're a movie star. Yeah. You're Alec Baldwin, so when yeah. you say you support the troops, that in is... Yeah. And they say, well, you want to be something bigger than yourself. Yeah. I was um, 17, or virtually on my birthday when I joined the Black Watch. And I found myself a little time later on a parade square in Valcarce in coveralls, because yeah. you weren't allowed any regimental insignia. And I've been told, hey, listen, you know, what are you going to do? Be clean, look sharp, it'll be fine. Put a crease in your coveralls and make sure when you get your weapon, it's clean. On the third day, we get our weapon. The old bolt action, right. go, very very heavy weapon, and you clean. I clean. You get it with grease on it, and I cleaned it off. And I had the cleanest weapon in the platoon. Yeah. Put a little bit of uh, uh, nail polish, clear nail polish on your thumb because you'd go port arms. Yeah. They inspect the breach. Then you go like this. You get your thumb down there, trying to reflect the sun up the barrel so yeah. it would look great when you look down and see if it was clean. And I go on parade, and sergeant comes to me. You. Dirty little man with a stream of invective that wouldn't be polite on the show. I mean, I clean it. My weapon. Not your weapon, you dirty little man. It's your fingernails. I'm still a bit fetishy about my fingernails. Well, I, I mean, look, I didn't, I didn't own a toothbrush when I joined the army. I mean, I, that was my background. I, I wasn't familiar with those things. Clean fingernails? I don't they clean themselves? You know. and, uh, and he said, you dirty little man, you come on my trade screw. Dirty fingernails. He said, do you know where you are? I said, yeah, I'm in Valcarce. It's like 40 miles from anything worth doing. Yeah. He said, no. He says, you're on a Black Watch Parade Square. Yeah. And he said, do you know what that means? Yeah. You think that it's just, he said, who's here with you? I kind of looked around. And I was, the platoon, he said, no. He says, a regiment is an idea. It exists over time. It's those who were, yeah. those who are, and those who will be. Standing here with you today are the men who died in the assault wave at D-Day. Yeah. They're the men who fell at Dieppe. Yeah. They're the ones that fell at Pashadale and are memorialized at Vimy Ridge, right. who relieved Ladysmith, and he went on. And your cousins and the Imperials right. who broke the square at, 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 at Waterloo so that we speak English here today and not right. froggish, as he right. put it, right. in his right. Right. unpopular right. way. Right. And I mean, I just never <laughs> thought of that. Yeah. I mean, it suddenly located me in... And he said, get off my parade. So I found myself running around the parade square with my rifle above my head, which is my punishment. And, and I ran until I just couldn't run anymore, and I just flopped on the ground. And, and uh, figured, I'm going home. I don't need any of this effing stuff, you see. Yeah. And finally, they marched him off. The corporal took him off, and he came home. And he said, OK, you want to come to the orderly room? I'll get you to go home. And a voice within me, I heard myself say, I don't want to go home. I don't got a home. I don't got nowhere to go, Sergeant. And he said, well, you know what it's going to take to stay here? And I said, yeah, I, I, I do. And I heard myself say, it wasn't I want to be something bigger. I said, I want to be worthy of all those guys you said are watching me right, right now. Right. I want to be worthy. It's not about being part of something bigger than yourself. That's easy. Yeah. Yes. But the, the, the yearning to be worthy yeah. of something noble, Right. Right. that's what Gordy Betts had. Yeah. When he said, I knew what I had to die for. Yeah. That was a nobility. Yeah, of of all that is good in people, and it's yeah. yeah. He, he would he would if Gordy were here, he would stand up and say, "You're right. There is a problem with Islam, for example, in yeah, our country. Yeah, no, no. Not but, a problem with Muslims. There is a problem. But but it's also about understanding, as regiments do, but as societies used to, that that uh, that that uh, a, a, a society is a compact between past and present and the future, and yes. that it's not just the ghosts of all those uh, glorious and, in some cases, doomed battles uh, uh, are present yeah. on the parade ground, but also the soldiers yet to come. And you feel today uh, that we do just live in the moment. And to go back to what your sergeant said, 
uh, you, you, that he, he knew uh, that they didn't want to live in that world, so in a sense that the world Hitler would be making for them, so in a sense they knew what they had to die for. And you do get the feeling that uh, today uh, you see this all over Europe in, uh, today, that they have, they have nothing to die for. They, 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 they think there's nothing worth dying for. And you get the feeling that, in a sense, there's nothing worth living for either. It's they, the, the two things are always linked uh, in that When way. your self-importance becomes so great yeah. that you can't understand anything, yeah. that you are worth sacrificing for yeah. because you are so important, yeah. and that's Hollywood, uh, then you have, you have left civilization behind. We, we, uh, we, we lost men, the Black Watch lost men in Afghanistan. Right. Um, and, and the pall that fell, fell over right. the, yeah. the existing regiment reminded me of, of, uh, of a Sergeant Major, we became Sergeant Major Jackson, right. who said to me, do you know who stands here with you? Yeah. Um, and the thing about the regiment, of course, is you feel they're always with you. It's yeah. an interesting thing. It becomes a connection between you and your society, exactly what you, yeah. you, would just, what you just described. Yeah. But uh, in Hollywood, everyone's so important that uh, perhaps the other guy can, but not me. I'm, I, I live upstairs. It's the downstairs people. Yeah. Who, you see, when they, they would go around saying, America's tired of the war, and yet I knew right. that the people who were actually fighting the war right. weren't tired of it. They were more scared that the great victories they had won in Iraq would be wasted we're by Obama, be, which in fact happened. Yeah. They would much rather have gone back and fought that, kept that, the, the, the victory in that war. The people who were tired of the war were the, the elite, and certainly in yeah, Hollywood, yeah. the people who never served, and they were tired of the war because other people's service reminded them of their own true unimportance. Well, thank, thank you for uh, talking a, a, about that with us uh, today, Lionel. And I hope, I hope ev eventually uh, the Dieppe Raid film does I get so. made, not just for your regiment, but for the other participants. For, for, and for all the people who, yeah. who figured out that they weren't so important that they couldn't die for something more important. And that's, the, and that's the point about it. It's a very particular story, uh, but its meaning is, is universal, like all the best stories, is yeah. universal and for our time as, uh, as much as theirs. Great, uh, great to Thank talk with you. Thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate it's it. Been, uh, it's been a pleasure.